In the Voice of Russia World Service, welcome to another edition of the Christian Message from Moscow. Today we acquaint you with two true stories that were published in Russian Orthodox periodicals. Each, in its own way, is most instructive for Christians. We begin with a letter by a reader of a popular Orthodox newspaper, Cured by Faith which is published in the southern Russian town of Krasnodar. In the words of its publishing staff, the paper is intended for those who are tired of suffering alone. The author of the letter requested that her name not be mentioned, and after you've heard the story, you will understand why. Dear Editorial, I first subscribed to your paper in April of 2006, and wish I had done so sooner, since, due to my spiritual ignorance, I've made a great many unpardonable blunders the principal one being that I introduced my own daughter to the so-called esoteric sciences, moreover, at my own initiative and insistence. I first began acquiring occult literature a long time ago, probably from the early 1990s. These were publications that instructed one how to develop various extraordinary abilities, clairvoyance, hypnosis, bioenergetics, etc. I was seeking refuge from daily humdrum life and I thought I could rise above my initial limited abilities. My daughter naturally had more time to spend mastering these sciences, so she achieved certain impressive results. She managed to sense the warmth emanating from objects, see the energy radiating from them and even use her own energy impulse to stop a clock in mid-tick. I decided that my daughter's amazing abilities could be used for a profit. So together we re-equipped my mother's one-room flat into an office, placed ads in the papers, and sat down to wait for the clients to come trooping in. Initially, there weren't all that many of them. So we embarked on another venture, offering our services to various organizations in detecting geopathogenic zones. We located these zones with the help of a metal frame, Then we would provide the office staff with instructions as to where not to place the furniture, the plants, etc. By that time, our newspaper ads had started to work. When we had accumulated a clientele, there was no longer a need to do the rounds of various organizations with our recommendations. My daughter plunged headlong into these bioenergetic sessions with her clients, and I could see she enjoyed the process. It was not only that she was driven by a desire to make money, 
There was something else there too, something I couldn't quite pinpoint at the time. I could see she wasn't getting enough sleep, rising early, rushing through her breakfast to make a dash for the office. I was so happy my daughter had found something useful to occupy herself with. She didn't even bother to go for a higher education, since she was certain she no longer needed it. Her bioenergetics practice was more than enough. A year and a half passed. We earned enough money to buy a new apartment. Half a year later, a car. We were convinced we'd hit the jackpot, and we had it made for life. If it hadn't been for the increasing peculiarities of my daughter, we'd still be living the good life. But God had chosen to punish us already in this life. It all began when my daughter started talking to herself, or rather, talking to someone in a conspicuously empty room. When I asked her who she was talking to, she replied that two angels, with a wise elder, would occasionally visit her, with the latter even showing her how to cure people. A while later, my daughter began sleeping with the lights on. She explained this by saying that instead of an elder, she was now increasingly plagued by an irate, evil man who showered abuse and threats upon her. He would come at night, so she preferred to leave the light on. And it all went from bad to worse. The neighbors would call in the paramedics from the psycho ward when my daughter's cries got particularly eerie. They would sedate her, and she'd sleep for two days. I bribed the medics so they wouldn't cut her off to a mental ward. Soon I realized that I was losing control, that it was becoming impossible to cope with her on my own. My daughter would smear herself with her own excrements and attempt to go out that way. I could barely contain her. So, finally, I decided to have her committed. The diagnosis was schizophrenia, although there was no history of mental illness in either my family or that of my husband. Six years passed. My daughter is still in the same deplorable state. From time to time, she's admitted to hospital for a three-month spell. Then they allow her to go home for a while. The doctors say she will never fully recover. Although I still hope for the best, since I remember her the way she was when she was in perfect health. I cannot reconcile myself with her debilitating illness. I pondered long and hard the reasons for my girl's illness. Once, on the day of Saint Nicholas the Miracle Maker, I decided to go to an Orthodox church. I sat down on a bench and started to cry. The parishioners all huddled round me, asking what was the matter, and I briefly narrated my story. They told me that the demons had claimed possession of my girl's spirit. I started at their words and asked. What demons? My daughter did nothing but good for people. She would foretell their future and even cured some of them. One man surreptitiously placed an edition of your newspaper into my bag. There was an article there entitled, "Does the curse exist? How do you avoid it?" And I read this article upon getting home. The following day, I decided to write to you. It was because I wanted to share my grief with those who understood its origins. In other words, with you. Today, there are many who follow the same erroneous path as my daughter and I did. On TV, they often openly advertise the services of various occult healers, fortune tellers, and such like. And most of the viewers have no idea what disasters befall those seemingly fortunate and gifted people practicing these. Occult sciences, for they attempt to conceal their sorrows from the public eye in the hopes of maintaining their lucrative business. 
At the end of my letter, allow me to address those who are trying to be superhuman and walk the road my daughter walked. Stop. The atonement will be terrifying indeed, and not for you alone. You are listening to the weekly feature The Christian Message from Moscow. A reader of a popular Orthodox magazine, Russian house Nikolai Nyustroyev, from the Siberian town of Kemerova, sent in a remarkable story to the magazine's editorial staff. We decided you would find the story of interest, too. This is at once a scary and instructive story, forcing one to ponder many things. Its main character, Ivan Ramashenko, was born in 1907 and died in 1962. Ivan Ramashenko had a very difficult childhood, for he was an orphan. Nothing is known about his father, while his mother died of typhus when the boy was just seven. Soon after, the First World War broke out. Ivan worked as a shepherd's boy, then an apprentice to a shoemaker, and upon coming of age, he was a hired help for some time. After the revolution, he finished secondary night school, worked at one of the post offices of his district, and some time later became the head of this post office. He worked so well they even wrote about him in the papers. He was always a profoundly religious Christian, although he never displayed this in any way. When the Great Patriotic War of 1941-1945 broke out, Ivan Ramashenko wasn't called up to join the army because of his illness. At the beginning of the war, when our army was retreating under the onslaught of the Hitlerites, he helped as best he could by working as a guide. He knew the local area so well he led our detachments across local terrain in bypass of the villages occupied by the Germans. And, in 1942, he was forced to live under German occupation. In January 1943, our army liberated Ivan Ramashenko's native village. But, instead of rejoicing, Ivan found himself in trouble. Some local ill wisher wrote a delation on him, accusing him of collaborating with the Nazis. He was arrested. The investigation continued for over a year. Ivan refused to sign the incriminatory statement. Nonetheless, Ivan Ramashenko was indicted and sent to prison camp for ten years. Even in confinement, Ivan lived the life of a true Orthodox Christian. He prayed even observed the fasts. He would tell his cellmates about the lives of the saints, the Holy Writ, recited the psalms and prayers that he knew by heart. Once, on Easter, he refused to turn up for work. As punishment, he was promptly sent to a so-called stone cell, a place where there was only a standing room. As a rule, They would leave the offenders in this stone cell without any outer garments for 24 hours. To add to the torment, there was always a bright lamp lit in this cell and water dripped onto the person's head. Ivan Ramashenko found himself in this stone cul-de-sac on a bitterly cold day when the temperature was 30 degrees Celsius below zero. Usually, nobody survived this torture chamber. And so, Ivan Ramashenko was thrown into this terrifying cell and kept there for three days. (laughs) 
When three days later the guard was sent to collect Ramashenko's body, he saw something that left him numb with amazement. The prisoner, completely covered by a layer of ice, was alive and calmly gazing back at him. The sentinel dashed off in horror. All those in the camp promptly came to look at this incredible sight. They placed Ivan Ramashenko in a prison hospital and plagued him with questions regarding how he'd survived. After all, prior to him, nobody had ever come out of this cell alive. All Ivan could say was that throughout those three days he'd never slept but constantly prayed to God. To begin with, it was terribly cold. But already by the end of the first day, it grew warmer. And on the third day, it was really warm. What's more, the warmth was coming from within somewhere. This event had so great an impact on everyone that they left Ivan Ramashenko alone. Moreover, the head of the prison camp ordered that Easter days be days of rest for all the inmates. As for Ivan, he granted him permission to skip work on church holidays. Some time passed, and the prison camp got a change of bosses. The new head warden was a veritable beast of a man, cruel, heartless. When Easter came again, he sent all the inmates off to chop lumber. Ivan Ramashenko once again refused to work on this holy day. The head warden was informed of this, and he immediately ordered that the dogs be set upon Ivan. These were special dogs, trained to tear a man to bits. The guards let loose the dogs. All the prisoners stood stock still in terror. Ivan bowed to all the four corners of the earth and began to pray. He read Psalm 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty and so on. To begin with, the dogs, bucking ferociously, lunged for Ivan Ramashenko. However, before reaching him, they stopped short, as if they'd come up against some invisible barrier. The dogs stood there, barking. First, they barked angrily. Then the noise grew quieter and quieter, until they slopped down into the snow and soon fell asleep. Ivan Romashenko survived camp and, in December 1952, he returned to his native village. After this, he lived another ten years. He went to his maker on September the 14th, 1962, into the embrace of a God he staunchly believed in all his honest life. Today's edition of The Christian Message from Moscow. It was directed by Vladimir Dermin, editor and musical framework Tatiana Shvitsova, sound engineer Olga Debranravova, and your hosts Svetlana Yakimenko and Pavel Novichkov. All the very best to you. Join us again same time next week.
святому.